Now more than ever, people need to go within and plug into that cellular memory, plug into the divine source, detach as much as possible from the matrix. A lot of these people that have all these abilities, who have celestial star ancestry, they're operating not only throughout this cosmos, but in higher planes, and they're working against the Draco Empire. The photonic energy and the cosmic rays will activate our higher centers. And it's incumbent upon us to ride that frequency wave. Hello again, everybody. This is James Bartley, and you are listening to Bartley's Commentaries on the Cosmic Wars. Today is Wednesday, January 11th, 2017. And in today's segment, I will talk about ETs, what it means to be descended from an extended ET higher dimensional at times star family, what it means to be boots on the ground, ground crew, and how we need to ride this frequency wave to get above all of the turbulence from the lower dimensions which have coalesced with this third dimension. In a previous commentary, I talked about how we may already be in the fourth dimension due to the fact that so much of this evil and filth and perversity is now in your faces, our faces, collective faces. Uh, it's all being normalized, and truth is being perverted to the point where, as we pointed out earlier, the truth is regarded as fake news, and the fake news, the propaganda lies, is regarded as the sole truth. So everything is an inversion. So what's going on now? Well, we're experiencing another one of those periods uh, on and around a Mercury retrograde. And as my friend Cassie, yet another dragon slayer from the old days, used to say, the lizards are swarming. The lizards are swarming. And what did she mean by that? What she meant by that was not only are lower density fourth dimensional reptilians and other interdimensional reptilians are making more and more inroads into our three-dimensional space, but they are working through these hosty reptilian-human, Draco-human hybrids to cause all kinds of problems, discordance, chaos, acrimony, etc., etc. One thing about these rep hybrids and Draco hybrids they are not handling this energetic shift very well. The powers that be want to terraform this planet and plunge it into the lower density end of things. That way it's easier for lower dimensional entities to come here to manifest in our physical reality. It allows predatory service-to-self type subterranean creatures the opportunity to spend more and more time on the surface or at least to conduct more operations on the surface, whether or not they want to be known or seen. That's another matter entirely. And by making this a lower dimensional hellhole, basically, it allows these negative beings of all stripes, including their hosted hybrid minions here on the surface, seemingly free reign to do whatever they want, and a lot of them are just going batshit crazy, as my friends in Texas would say. So the lizards are swarming, and it's manifesting all across the board in interpersonal relationships, on the internet, on Facebook, etc., etc., so what we have to do, dear listeners, is ride this frequency wave because there is this higher dimensional frequency streaming in. 
and many clairvoyants, mystic seers, etc., perceive this energy as a golden light, a golden energy field that's streaming in. We are in alignment with the galactic center, so we're getting more and more energy, intensified cosmic energy and gamma rays streaming in from the cosmic center. Our solar system is being bathed in it. I know it's not the easiest thing to do, and I wouldn't presume to tell you something that I don't do or have difficulty in doing at times because my Scorpio dragon nature, I don't, like, put up with a lot of bullshit. In fact, I can only take so much. I, I have a limit to what I can put up with, so I have to work very hard to maintain my inner harmony. So I don't want to come off as sounding like a hypocrite or a phony, you know, do what I say, not what I do kind of thing. I am an imperfect being. By no means have I arrived yet. I'm still in the healing and reintegration phase. I'll be the first to say that. I wouldn't presume to thump on my chest and say, I'm here, you know, I'm glowing in an incandescent light field, and right? And you can call me like, Rakananda, Jakananda, or something, come up with some really cool yogic sounding name. No, I wouldn't presume to do that. Because in the past, and it's taken a lot of self work and healing, and sometimes I still have challenges with it, where I, I let my emotions and temper and whatnot get the better of me. But like Bernard Gunther said, and not using this as a cop out, I'm just pointing out that. Sometimes righteous anger, sometimes righteous indignation is exactly what we need. It's one of the tools in our toolbox. It's one of the arrows in our quiver. We can't just keep laying down and rolling over every time evil manifests. We just can't keep knuckling under and, and sounding like a Chinese coolie. Yes, boss. Yes, boss. Yes, boss. Yes, boss. Kissing up all the time. We can't do that. Because the survival of the human race is at stake, as well as all the flora and fauna on this lovely planet and the lovely planet itself. We have to draw a line in the sand and say, no moss. Beyond this point, I am not retreating. Right? So pick and choose your battles carefully as much as possible. Keep your eyes on the big picture. Try not to get provoked. Because all these swarming lizards all over the place will start messing with you and harassing you and picking at you. And what we have to do is maintain our inner harmony, our inner equilibrium, our inner serenity. Not always as easy as it sounds. And I'll be the first to say that with my Scorpio dragon nature. I have a streak of righteous indignation running down my back a mile wide and ten miles long. As many of you do. Okay, so I've talked about the swarming lizards and what we need to do to overcome them. Remember, they're the ones behind the eight ball, not us. They're the ones that are having a difficult time adjusting to these new frequencies streaming in from the higher dimensions and also streaming in from the galactic core. All of these energies are enhancing us. We have to work at staying grounded, staying centered, staying embodied maintaining our inner harmony, equilibrium, and then letting these energies do the work for us. It's yet another tool. It's another arrow in our quiver. Okay, about the ETs. Some of you realize by now that you are descended from one or more extraterrestrial cultures. Some of them of a higher dimensional nature, fifth dimensional, sixth dimensional, seventh dimensional, and on up. And truth be told, some of you had lived multiple existences in a variety of different dimensions, a variety of different worlds, a variety of different planes of existence and planes of reality. This is not your first barbecue. You have all the institutional memory, you have 
all the wisdom and the metaphysical quantum abilities within you. It's still stored in your morphic resonance field. It's still stored in your DNA. DNA is more than just a transceiver of information, a sender and receiver. There's an interdimensional quantum aspect to it, a portal aspect to it, if you will, which can pull in information, energy, frequencies from other higher dimensions. And we see this all the time when you're, you know, the inverse of this, when you're in the presence of a raging reptilian hybrid, lunatic, frothing in the mouth, narcissist, sociopath, and you feel their negative energy, it literally makes your skin crawl. You feel it as a pressure on your heart center, you feel it as a pressure in your solar plexus, in your in some cases in your base chakra or your sexual chakra. Well, that's all these negative energies, lower dimensional energies pouring out from their their very essence, their very being, and yes, indeed, their DNA. So if any of you doubt that your DNA itself is a stargate, a portal, a transceiver of information, a sender and a receiver, and that locked within your DNA, not necessarily locked, that's, a, that's the wrong word, uh, latent within your DNA, within your morphic resonance field, with, within your very essence and being, is the wisdom of the multiverse and the ability to plug right back into your quantum higher dimensional self, self, selves. We are all the sum of all of our parts, the sum of all our parts all our different counterparts and this, that, or the other time, stream, timeline, alternate reality. They all share the same soul mind as us. They all share, they are all aspects of our oversoul. Our oversoul itself, a manifestation of divine source. So when someone says, oh, well, I'm descended from beings in the Sirius system, or I'm from originally from Lyra, or I'm originally from Orion, well, there's something to that. I just had Gary David on my show a few weeks back talking about the Hopi's connection with the Orion constellation. And he talked about the Lakota connection to Sirius. And I once attended a star family gathering conference where I had the great good fortune of meeting with the Lakota elders who were talking about their star ancestry, and they likewise talked about how they originally hailed from the Sirius system. I think Sirius B, if memory serves, but don't quote me on that. So it's embedded in the lore of a number of peoples here on the surface that they came from somewhere else. The Aborigines in Australia, they talk about coming from the Pleiades, and they say they've been here for a million years at least. Uh, there's a book out there, if you can find it in hardback, it's very hard to find and quite a collector's item. It's called The Lemurian Scrolls, and it's an absolute classic in the field, and it talks about how this swami in Hawaii was being shown by an archive keeper in at the Akashic Record in another dimension was being shown all this text from unknown obscure languages and somehow this Swami in Hawaii was instantly translating it and he was uh, conveying the contents of these scrolls in English or I forget what language to a scribe and the whole thing was being transcribed hence the Lemurian Scrolls, uh, and if you get a chance, please read that. So, there may be some people out there who roll their eyes, you know, you heard me last week talking about how these New Age la -dee come up and say, well, you know, I'm a Palladian hybrid walk-in, well, maybe, maybe not, I don't, I just got through saying, I don't doubt that whole concept, in fact, I believe it implicitly, but too many people identify, they forget about being embodied on Earth and anchoring higher dimensional frequencies, and they 
they focus too much on another star system, another constellation. And that's what being ground crew is all about. That's what being boots on the ground was all about, is all about. I first heard the term when I was reading Denise LaFay's fine book, talking about her ET experiences and uh, her past lives in ancient Egypt. And she described herself and others like her as boots on the ground, as ground crew. And that made perfect sense to me. Because again, we are the sum of all our parts. And she talked about how she was tutored in ancient Egypt in one of her previous incarnations by a higher dimensional Orion being and a higher dimensional uh, Palladian being, if memory serves. She also describes a highly emotional encounter with feline beings in ancient Egypt. She reckons it was about 13,000 BC, thereabouts. She was a male in that life. And she talked about how these feline extraterrestrials of a higher dimensional nature were only able to visit for a short time because the atmosphere, the energy of this dimension of the Earth at the time was way too dense for these feline beings. So they can only stick around for a short period of time. And we've heard similar accounts around the world of how the felines can only hang around for a short period of time in our dimension. Often as not, when they want to interact with us in our dream state, they take our consciousness and bring it up to a higher dimensional version of Earth, a higher dimensional version of Mars, a higher dimensional uh, version of some other place. So I believe implicitly in the whole concept of boots on the ground, ground crew. But I look askance at those who are New Age la dies and say they are Palladian hybrid walk-ins, but they're not walking the walk. They're saying they're walk-ins, but they're intolerant, they're judgmental. They don't want to hear about anything negative because I guess they don't want negative things that pollute their auric field, their energy field. So they just kind of bliss out and tune all that out, uh, which makes them a perfect tool for our contact forces. So when I talk about these issues, how some of us, our ground crew and our extended family is higher dimensional ETs, I am talking to a specific demographic a specific element within the surface population. And I do so not in an elitist sense, perish the thought. After all we've been through, after all the healing and reintegrating, uh, some people out there, because they know they have this celestial star ancestry, higher dimensional ET star ancestry, they presume to lord it over others. They presume to be superior to others, which means they didn't even learn lesson number one. Know thyself. Go within. Stay embodied. Anchor higher dimensional frequencies. Hold space for others. Be an uplifting person. Stand in the gap. Right? And so when you come across an ego-driven person, just know who's spouting all this metaphysical problem about being a like a six-dimensional Syrian being here to spend time on Earth, and Earth is just a school, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and they don't want to hear anything negative. They don't want to talk about reptilians. They don't want to talk about the Orwellian recycling, soul-harvesting prison planet that we're on. And then you know you're talking to the wrong person, and I wouldn't, Personally, I wouldn't presume to tell you what to do or who, to, who you associate with, but remember, you are who you associate with. If you associate with people of that ilk, ego-driven, self-centered, narcissistic, and they presume to tell you that there's some higher dimensional being and that there is no uh, negativity, that there's, we're only here to learn, that school is just a, uh, rather that earth is just a school, then you're, then you're spinning your wheels with the wrong person.
find somebody else. But again, sometimes you have to learn the hard way. Sometimes the only way to know a certain truth is to live it, to have made mistakes and made poor choices as far as association is concerned. And this happens a lot. It's happened to me, right? Sometimes it's the only way we can learn. Now, when we are a ground crew, boots on the ground, we get downloads in different ways. We're not all the same. We're not all cut from a, you know, with a cookie cutter. Are not all pumped out by a high speed press stamp. And I made this mistake. I compared myself to others. Well, why can't I intuit the way she does? Why can't I be clairaudient the way she is or he is or have etheric vision the way this person does? But we're all different and we process information and we download things differently. I can get downloads while I'm flapping my gums and talking and suddenly to the listener it may, see, may seem like I veer off in an entirely different direction. But really, I'm just going with what spirit wants me to talk about, what I'm being moved to talk about, what I'm being embodied to talk about. And I had to learn what my skill set is and what my abilities and gifts, if you will, are. And not to compare myself to others. It's very important for each year to do a specific job. And one more thought about this whole concept of Earth to being in school. My listeners are very intelligent, wise, old souls, so they already know what I'm talking about, but it bears repeating that this whole concept of Earth being a school is complete nonsense. Uh, it's not even a reform school. How could it be a school if we keep being recycled and have our memories swiped and have to accrue all this baggage, this karmic baggage unfairly when we can't even remember our past lives and we're just surrounded in our incarnations with our contactly manipulated and controlled people. Uh, what kind of a school is that? It's more like a like a chain gang in a friggin' prison somewhere. It's not it's not a school. And also a school when I think of hear the word school, I think of a school of fish. Maybe that's where they came up with the idea. Not putting fish down, my mind you, I feel fish have sentience as well. But that's my thoughts on this whole school. Uh, life is a school and earth is a school concept. I, I don't buy it. Getting back to the boots on the ground concept. We assimilate information, process information, receive downloads in, in ways unique to each one of us. Let's not compare ourselves to others. That's not fair to ourselves. We have to learn how we do, uh, how we process information and how we do things. And we have to learn how spirit and the divine matrix, as Greg Braden, talks to us. Uh, books talk to me. That's why I love going to used bookstores and buying used books and uh, going to libraries and, and whatnot, because books talk to me. I get guided to certain books. I get guided to certain pages within books. And also, like others throughout the ages, I look for signs, I look for information stimuli presented to me by the divine matrix either in the form of people places things animals dreams but some of you receive downloads and have mystical visions far more uh, vivid than I do you receive downloads and you receive visions of your previous incarnations slash parallel in incarnations and I would encourage you to to pay attention to these, but do it in an embodied state, not where you're off in your headspace, as Bernard Gunther talks about, where we get caught up in our headspace. And, and Lynn Williams talked about how Sasquatch describes humans as being three or four feet outside their bodies because they're so disembodied. There's so much in their headspace. When you meditate on some of these memories, whether it's your earthly incarnations in Atlantis or uh, ancient Rome or Egypt or India, wherever the case may be, uh, reflect on a past Native American life. 
I try to be embodied when I do that. I try to feel my body. I try to listen to what it tells me. I try to be my own kinesiology machine, if you will. I don't have a kinesiology machine, but I have friends who have worked with kinesiology, and they, they swear by it, and they say that it's really helped them heal and reintegrate process information. And some of these people are... Uh, my labs and and monarchs and people that have been subjected to horrific abuse so you know their, their way their word carries weight with me so in the absence of a kinesiology machine or something that will test our our responses and our our test our bodily reactions it's that much more important to stay embodied and feel our bodies and feel what our bodies are telling us and know when it's safe to stay with a certain memory, stay with a certain feeling. If you can ride out certain sensations that, uh, where the sensations won't go into meltdown mode and, and cause you uh, emotional or physical pain or distress, know when you can back off. Okay, I'm feeling this too much. I'm ab reacting too much. I'm going to safely pull myself out, right? Or you can, with intentions, just tell your subconscious, I only want to meditate and dwell on memories, feelings, sensations of past, present, future incarnations, whatever the case may be. But I only want to do so with memories, sensations, and feelings that I know I can handle that I know that I can properly assimilate. And then when you go through these processes, give yourself time to have a proper decompression state where you unwind, relax, process, move out any residual energy. And you can use grounding stones, healing stones, crystals. You can use a rife machine. There's a variety of modalities one can utilize to get back into a grounded, embodied state. Uh, I want to get my friend on here sometime to talk about primal heart therapy, which she swears by. Uh, it's a way to plug into one's physical heart, the most powerful electromagnetic organ we have in our bodies, which pump out a tremendous amount of electromagnetic energy, plug into the physical heart and work through these past life memories and work through these traumas and negative experiences we've had in this incarnation. So th there's a way to process this information in a grounded state, allow time for decompression afterwards to unwind, relax, process, and then continue this process when you feel the time is right. Take Take it in, in increments. Don't try to do too many things at once. Because, again, we are the sum of all our parts. When we can begin to stream in safely that higher dimensional frequency and energy from our extended ET star family, and remember, many of you, and it bears repeating, that you, you are not just part of an extended ET star family, you not only were an ET from your own higher dimensional extended star family, you are an ET in your higher dimensional star family because the part of you, the counterpart of you that shares the soul mind with you still exists, albeit in a different frequency, in a parallel reality that at times can merge, coalesce with ours. So always remember, it's not only that you have an extended ET far, uh, star family or families out there, because in truth, many of us are have had incarnations in multiple different uh, extended star families, some very positive service to other types and some not so positive. But... Also, that your, your counterparts, your other selves, which are quite aware of what you're going through, quite aware of 
the challenges you have to face in th rapidly increasing 3D physical embodiment, they know that you took on the toughest job there was, voluntar voluntarily relinqu relinquishing a lot of your sovereign nature, a lot of your sovereign isness, uh, being upon entering into this reincarnational cycle, this soul harvesting cycle. It took a lot of guts to do that. And your extended ET higher dimensional star families know this. They look in, upon you with awe and wonder. And they will do everything they can to help us. But we have to establish that calm link with them. We have to resonate at the right frequency, embody the right frequencies, and do so without short-circuiting, basically. In the old days and to this current day, there are many esoteric traditions where people train themselves uh, to be able to assimilate higher and higher dimensional frequencies and for many, it's a lifetime process because otherwise one just can't suddenly absorb all these higher frequencies. One can literally short circuit uh, the human nervous system, the brain, the, the physical and energetic body as presently constituted for a lot of people, even if they have higher dimensional DNA within them they're just generally not suited to absorb like a mass influx of higher dimensional, higher frequency energy all at one go. Some can assimilate a certain degree of higher dimensional energy. It does help to have been born into a certain bloodline and within one's morphic residence field and DNA profile, there exists the means, the capability to absorb these higher dimensional energies. And as time goes on, we have to process these energies because they're there. They're there to be processed. They're all around us. Despite all the efforts at chemtrailing and harping and all the Gwen Towers and the misuse of scalar waves, add to that GMO, chemtrailing, everything else, uh, the nanobots and nanotech and vaccines and everything else. We are still, we that demographic I was referring to earlier, we that subpopulation on the Earth's surface that have the innate ability to assimilate these higher dimensional frequencies, we can. We just have to give ourselves the opportunity. And that's why I also mentioned earlier how important association is. Some people are still stuck, joined at the hip, with people that are, quite frankly, negative, uh, resonating at a much lower, denser, denser uh, vibration, uh, possess the vile, vulgar, vulgar attributes and habits, uh, getting involved in negative activities and perverse activities and uh, all, all forms of self-abuse and self-sabotage. And when one associates with people like that, well, it's just like when you pluck one string on a guitar, pretty soon all the other strings on the guitar start to hum or vibrate at the same frequency as the first string that was plucked. Well, eventually you begin to resonate at the same frequency with those you associate with. And it can only be one person. It doesn't need to be a whole mob of people to bring your energy field down. I mean, people experience this all the time at the workplace, uh, negative family situations, toxic family situations, whatever the case may be. All it can take, though, is just one person, one individual to bring you down. So now more than ever, when the lag time between the intention going out and the manifestation, the response from the divine matrix or the answer to, to your question comes back that much sooner, the lag time between the question or the intention going out and the response coming back is getting shorter and shorter. That's why we really have to guard our minds. We have to practice mental hygiene. We have to 
be careful who we associate with. We are who we associate with. Sometimes prolonged isolation actually is beneficial for some people. I know at the time when one is going through it, it just seems like a real bummer. Jeez, you know, I'm not with anyone, not in a meaningful relationship. Don't have many friends. I'm stuck here way out uh, in Timbuk, not Timbuk 2, but Timbuk 29, relatively speaking. And you can still be in a big city, a big metropolitan area, and still be stuck way out in in Timbuk 29. I mean, I lived in San Diego for a long time, and there's a lot of single people in San Diego, a lot of isolated people. San Diego has always been a hub of social engineering, mind control, manipulation. So it's easy for one to get lost in the mix in San Diego. If you don't have family and close family friends nearby, if you've gone there say, with a military, and you decide you like the weather and you stay there afterwards, well, you may have developed friends in the military and you may have developed friends somewhere along the way, but you can still be isolated. But sometimes, as Sun Tzu said, our greatest weakness can be our greatest strength. If those, if there are some of you out there that are going through a period of isolation, Embrace it. Know that it won't last forever. Know that at a higher dimensional level, you're already interacting and have been with people of a like vibration. There are some people you see in your dreams and your higher dimensional experiences. You see them again and again. You don't know their names. You don't know where they're from. You, you don't really know anything about them. You just know that you interact with them on a somewhat regular basis in these higher states of being and higher dimensional states. And just know that you're not alone. You also have your extended ET star family, so and your your spiritual guides. Uh, you, some of you have Native American guides. Some of you have Aboriginal guides. Whatever the case may be, if you seem like you're cut off from your family, if they're located far away in a geographic sense, and you may not be in a committed partnership relationship at the moment, this is an ideal time to work on yourself. Take the time, embrace it, learn learn about yourself, learn to love yourself, learn to forgive yourself. That's important. They always talk about forgiving others. And, yeah, that's important because it lifts a burden from us, one of my challenges as a Scorpio dragon, right, when we've been wronged. Uh, forgiveness isn't really high in some of our list of priorities. So it's... You know, I'm a work in progress in that regard. But another aspect of forgiveness which needs to be mentioned is forgiveness of ourselves, too. Uh, our perceived failings, uh, the self-sabotage that we've sometimes been manipulated into doing out of ignorance, out of an externally imposed ignorance, the poor choices we made, the poor association we've made. Uh, throw all that out the window. Be forgiving of yourself. Remember your ground crew. You're here to anchor and sustain higher frequencies. And sometimes the best times we can do that is when we're by ourselves. Even in an age of instantaneous communications, the internet, social media. And there are so many people out there living these vicarious, make-believe lives on the internet, on Facebook. They don't really have any physical friends. And so they kind of make up for it on the internet. And there's really nothing wrong with that on the one hand, because I've met some wonderful people on the internet. I met some wonderful people on Facebook that I never would have met otherwise. But uh, for many, it's just, it's a form of like a simulation. It's another aspect of the matrix. If we're going to utilize these, tools like Facebook, for example. Let's use it for our own benefit and not get caught up in all of the drama and all the hype and all the craziness on it. That's a lesson for everybody. And remember that your best friend is often yourself, especially when you're going through these periods of isolation. But if you keep working and 
even if you're not consciously aware of, of what you're meant to do or what your goal is or what your destiny is, if you have a knowingness that you have a destiny to fulfill, that's important because your spirit guides, your higher dimensional ET extended star family, and your counterparts that share the same soul mind as you in future uh, timelines and parallel timelines, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Again, they know what you're going through. They know that what you're going through here is a hard slog. Uh, this existence in rapidly increasing 3D, the, the rapidly increasing illusionary time frequency with all of the many matrix glitches we're experiencing now, all the the time anomalies, the time loops, the time speeding up, time slowing down, uh, all that stuff. It, we're perceiving these things because we're beginning to assimilate information, but from a higher dimensional perspective. And from a higher dimensional perspective, logic, rationality, linear thinking really doesn't apply. In fact, if anything, it's a hindrance. One must be able to process information without really having to think about it, if that makes sense. Just a knowingness within one's being. It's, and it's different for each people, how they have, how they perceive or how they recognize this knowingness. Right? It's, it's constantly a struggle between the flesh and the spirit. And they've, the controllers, the would-be controllers have made it this way. But the trick is to stay embodied and to work through and process and work with the inner shadow, work with the inner self. Because otherwise, all these feelings of, of self, lack of self-worth, self-loathing, despair, loneliness, isolation, self-sabotage, OCD thought loops, they can be a real burden. They can really begin to drag one down. And not just, we were talking about being embodied, but then when one is burdened and burdened by such thoughts and such OCD thought loops and such negative feelings about oneself, that plugs us right into this nether dimension, which is a playground for all these negative entities. So let's keep that in mind because I know for some of you out there, it's important to not only be aware that you're ground crew, be aware that you're boots on the ground and you want to make a meaningful difference, but it's important to establish and maintain that calm link with your oversoul, with your higher self, with your parallel selves, with your higher dimensional ET star family, and it always starts within by divesting ourselves of all these feelings that, that hold us down. And, and of course, everything comes down to a personal choice. What we ingest, what we eat, what we drink, what we take on board as far as uh, information is concerned, whether it's from the so-called alternative uh, news media or it's from the real fake mainstream media, uh, we have to learn to take in as little of that as possible, enough to keep us apprised of what's going on, because that allows us to access information from a higher dimensional source, which can provide clarity, which can provide more background information, more background color. So I feel we cannot isolate ourselves from what's going on in the world, but we have to be able to take in as little of it as necessary in order to allow higher spirit, higher source to give us the downloads we need. Because it's probably in the destiny of some of you to work solo. And I did for many years. I may have had a lot of friends that I maintained comms with on the phone or on the internet or in a chat room. But for many years, it was just uh, me, myself, and Irene, basically. I mean, I was alone for many years in a city full of single people, i.e. San Diego. Sure, I had work acquaintances, uh, but I really couldn't unburden myself on them and share this kind of stuff. Uh, the people that I knew that uh, I knew in the San Diego UFO Society, Eventually, I kind of drifted away from the UFO crowd 
in Southern California because it was so fractious and riven with all the kinds of acrimony and uh, you know unpleasantness, which basically is typical of so many UFO uh, communities. There is no such thing as UFO community. Uh, me and Neil Cruz last week were talking about community. So eventually I drifted away from the San Diego UFO Society and uh, my other contacts in the greater UFO field in the American Southwest. But I still maintain, maintain comms with key friends, uh, Barbara Bartholik and, and others, Evie Lorgan and others. And that was what provided me the validation I needed when I went through some kind of hardcore experience. I knew that I didn't have to process it on my own that I had someone on the other end of a com computer terminal or on the other end of the phone that I could work through these issues with. I didn't know at the time that I had a higher dimensional extended ET star family. I felt that I had some kind of outer space connection, if you will, but I didn't realize that I had this within me, this boots on the ground, ground crew sensibility, which I now know I do have and have been working to explore and further my understanding of. I didn't realize it all that time I was in San Diego. It, that was a formative time for me where I just had to learn and learn and learn and process, learn, assimilate, process. A lot of it had to do with, with learning the dark side, learning the modus operandi of the reptilians and the manis beings. And, and I have so many people to thank to help me over the years that really taught me a lot, made me the person I am today. And so we arrive at a point where we're comfortable knowing that we're boots in the ground, that we, and eventually we know that we can use certain modalities, certain energization techniques, certain meditation techniques, a lot of times these are unique to ourselves, and we can stay plugged in that way to source, stay plugged in at some level, even if it doesn't seem like you're making progress on a conscious level. Believe me, if your heart is in the right place, if the desire is there, if you're putting in the effort, if you're putting energy into motion, you're putting out the the intentions to the divine matrix, yes, your spirit guides, your higher dimensional extended ET star family will hear you and they will do their part. And you just have to be receptive to the sometimes subtle nuanced clues that they provide you, the, the guidance that they give you. Uh, for me, it was never so, so blatant like it is for some people. And yeah, at one point, like I was saying earlier, I mean, there was, I made the mistake of comparing myself to others. Oh, why don't I have these far out woo woo mystical experiences that other people do? You know, and then when I sit and talk about some of my own experiences, some people are gobsmacked. Wow, you've had a lot of stuff happen to you, a lot of amazing mystical stuff. But because it happened to me, and maybe not with the same frequency that it's happened to others, I don't see it that way, right? Uh, compared to others who are more gifted than me, that have uh, etheric vision and uh, can plug right into the Akashic Record and can receive messages and valid information from spirit. Again, I had to learn what my gifts were, how I assimilated and processed higher dimensional information. And truth to tell, when I look back on it, I was acting on a lot of intuitive hunches, if you will, which I look back on now, and a lot of that was higher dimensional guidance. A lot of that was me, to use a term a buddy of mine, a Scottish mate of mine, Ben Light uses, uh, streaming in our higher consciousness, uh, to put a little slant on an internet term there, streaming in our higher consciousness. I was doing it all that time. I was doing it in those conversations with Barbara Bartholick when suddenly I would just start saying things that were on the phone and she would give that famous <clears throat> gasp of hers and you know implore me to write down what I just said, right? 
And I'd say, well, what did I just say? Because I was just in the moment, I was just streaming in and verbalizing what it was, what it was I was streaming in. And I wasn't even aware that I was streaming in anything at a time. I just thought I was coming up with logical conclusions based on the available data. But I was coming up with information that Barbie said that she'd spent a lifetime amassing 30 plus years. And this happened a lot. So after a while, I took it for granted. I didn't realize that was a gift, right? Because I thought a gift had to be like the ability to have a mystical vision, the ability to peer into the Akashic Record, the ability to see into other dimensions. So I fell into the trap of comparing myself to others and not being aware of the gifts that I had. And all that time, I'm streaming in my higher consciousness. I'm streaming in information from a higher dimensional, higher spiritual source. And I didn't even know it. But I do now. And I don't take it for granted. And that's how also, if truth be known, kind of how I determine upon future guests for the Cosmic Switchboard podcast. It's not just information that I feel or guests that I feel would make really good guests. I'm just kind of intu intuitively guided to them because I feel the information they are sharing is going to help activate us, is going to talk to a part of us deep within us, deep within our innermost recesses of our being, our very being, and strike a resonant chord and remind us, aha, yes, I resonate with this person's information. And you know what, folks, sometimes as far as the listeners are, gonna get, are concerned, I'm not going to get it right. Sometimes I'm going to get a guess that some of you will just not resonate with, right? I mean, I've listened to Coast to Coast. I've listened to some of these other popular podcasts, and I didn't always resonate or agree with some of the things that a person was saying. I mean, am I the only one that's gone through that? I'm sure I'm not. So a lot of times people are overly critical about, oh, you know, you should have gotten that guess. You should get this guess. Well, a lot of it is subjective. I go with what's, where spirit moves me. I go where I feel that the guest will provide information that at some level will resonate with the listeners and be beneficial to them at, at some level. And sometimes the listeners, or some of them anyway, just may not jibe or sink in with a guest, and that's okay, right? It's a, it's a hit or a miss proposition, but I like to think that for the most part, I've gotten it right and I've gotten some, I've gotten some really good guests and, uh, especially the guests that, that are coming up in the next few weeks are really, really gonna give, uh, our, the listeners uh, food for thought and strike a resonant chord uh, within many of you. So I've been talking in, in general terms about being boots on the ground. So it's more than just visions of otherworldly vistas of looking up at a night sky that doesn't look anything like the night sky we see on Earth. It's more than just uh, seeing woo-woo pyramids on some other planet or uh, perceiving oneself or having memories of, of being an actual alien, because that happens too. It's more than that. Because we're the sum of all of our parts. It's what our bodies tell us. And I'm telling you this from, from my perspective, from the way that I assimilate information, the way I perceive and feel energies. I'm very empathic. I'm very sensitive to energies. And I'm also uh, sensitive to what my own body and my own energy fields are telling me. And it, the latter let me know if I'm on the right track or not. So go with that. And the book that I referenced earlier, Denise LaFay's book, uh, A Light Worker's Mission, I think it's called. Um, um, I'll look it up, but you can find it. Denise, uh, last name, L E space F A E, LaFay. And it's called A Light Worker's Mission with a subtitle. 
I found it to be a very interesting, thought-provoking book, and a lot of the information in it was uh, very uh, struck a resonant chord within me. Let's put it that way. And also another book uh, that did was the book Earth by Barbara Marciniak and the, uh, of course, the Bringers of the Dawn book, which I, I thought was a fantastic book and uh, really struck a resonant chord for me when I read it way back when. So just remember that we are the sum of all our parts. And sometimes, and this happened to me, and this benefited me greatly, sometimes the people that come into your life, if they have an awareness of their own connection to a higher dimensional source, to a higher dimensional extended ET star family, and they're not some starry-eyed New Age la da and they're not afraid of talking about quote-unquote negative things, and they're well aware of the depredations meted out by the reptilians and some of the gray factions and the mantis beings and whatnot, and they're aware of what's going on here on the surface and are aware of the recycling and the soul harvesting, and they're aware of their own Again, their own ancestral star ancestry. Sometimes it pays to listen to these people because by listening to these people, it strikes a resonant chord within you. And sometimes these people are brought to you at key junctures in your life for a purpose to activate you. We all have an internal energetic alarm clock that's set to go off for different people at different times. And sometimes these alarm clocks go off more than once in our lives. So there's a one, one alarm clock to wake you up to the surface level stuff, the fiat currency a monetized debt scam. Then there's another alarm clock to go off to remind you of the ET aspect in your life. Then there's another alarm clock to uh, wake you up to what Bernard Grunther and others call the hyperdimensional interference aspect in all its manifestations, the AI aspect. Another alarm clock goes off for the AI aspect. Uh, I've had a lot of alarm clocks go off in my life. And I'm thankful for each and every one of them. Because at a higher consciousness, oversoul level, we, just like people, you know, you've seen them hit the snooze buttons, right? That's snooze one, that's snooze two, that's snooze three, and then finally they wake up. It's similar to that. It's kind of a you know bad example, but... There's a certain number of alarms that go off within us until we really begin to recognize it. And some of the stuff that we may have thought was New Age la -di da metaphysical pablum in the past doesn't really sound like that when it's coming from a certain source, a source that you respect, a source that you resonate with, it's a source that you have esteem for. Some of the information that didn't make sense in the past or you didn't believe now makes sense because you've had that much changing, growing, and learning in the meantime, in the process. And be thankful for that. Those of you that are going through periods of isolation, and I'll be the first to say that I do believe in some cases that negative forces strive to keep people isolated, that negative forces strive to keep people out of meaningful intimate relationships, that negative forces strive to plug us into bad association, bad networks, bad influences. All of that is, is true in my book. I believe it. I've experienced it. So when one finds them, themselves in a state of prolonged isolation, embrace it. Know that it won't last forever. And also know that it will teach you to believe in yourself, self-reliance, endurance, stubbornness is the basis for endurance, which is the basis for survival. And when you've lived alone for long enough and had to do things on your own for long enough, you develop a sense of self-reliance, which is invaluable, which is priceless. You know you can get by. You know you can do things on your own. You don't need necessarily someone to compliment you or someone to complete you. If, if that comes for you, if that is in your future sometimes, so be it. But at the present moment, you're self-sufficient and you know that you can handle any kind of difficulties, come what may, on your own. 
but you never really are alone, are you? Because you're streaming in this higher consciousness from your oversoul, and you're in grounded, you're embodied, you're plugged directly into source, higher dimensional influences, spiritual influences in much higher planes are communicating with you. We just have to familiarize ourselves with the language. Listen to what your body tells you. Go with your gut instinct. Listen to how your body reacts to certain energy fields. Listen to how your energy, energy body, excuse me, reacts to certain energy fields. It's all about vibration. It's all about resonance. It's all about frequency. And we are transceivers. And our DNA is more than just transceivers. It's they're actual stargates. They're portals. I brought up the example earlier of these negative, <laughs> what Tom Montauk would call an organic negative energy portal. Well, if it works for them, where they're streaming in all this lower density negative energy from some nether planes, nether dimensions, why can't, couldn't the inverse of that, us streaming in higher dimensional energy from higher spiritual planes through our DNA, activating our DNA, causing our DNA to activate and go from two strands or three strands and four strands and, and on up? Why not us? Why not now? By, by now, excuse me, many of you should know that there is no such thing as the word impossible. After all, what we've been through, the hyperdimensional interference we've had to be put up with, uh, all kinds of stuff that we've had to endure, which if you, if you, at a younger age, if you'd seen it happen to somebody in a movie, some cheesy, like, Netflix B-grade science fiction movie, you'd just say, that's ridiculous, or that's impossible, that's unbelievable. But if you've lived it, or lived things similar to what you see, in these grade B Netflix movies or sci-fi channel movies, and you've actually lived it, well, then it's not so impossible. So let's stop putting limitations on ourselves, shall we? And let's plug into divine source, stay embodied, stream in those higher dimensional frequencies, stream in information from our oversoul, stream in information from our extended ET star family, Embrace that. Know that your counterparts exist. Know that your counterparts in a future timeline, in a parallel timeline, are reaching down, if you will, giving you, giving you a hand up. They're not giving you a hand out. They're not going to tell you what to do. They're not going to, you know, uh, give you like an instruction manual. But they're going to give you a hand up. And you're going to have to kick, kick and scratch and claw for everything. But in the end, you'll be where you need to be. So we've reached the end of this week's segment of Bartley's Commentaries on the Cosmic Wars. And wherever you may be, dear listeners, have a very pleasant day. Have a very pleasant evening. Goodbye for now. <laughs>